Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemler. Our next guest is an actor. He's an author. He's a screenwriter. You loved him on The Sopranos, Alex Inc., Mad Dogs. And now you can see the one and only Michael Imperioli in the new film, Cabaret Maxime, where he also serves as a producer. He plays a struggling cabaret owner battling gangsters, clientele, and his own employees. Please welcome the great Michael Imperioli. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, you have produced three movies in your time, or is it more than that? Uh, three movies, yeah. Three movies. This is your third? Yeah. What brought you on as a producer? How did that work? Um, I've worked with a director on as an actor twice before this, um, and he asked if I wanted to produce it, which I don't really know what he was expecting me to do. Um <laughs> Uh, it more, I think it was more like moral support and being kind of a, um, uh, kind of a father figure on the set, you know, and just uh, kind of a. Uh, m most of my producerial duties came after and trying to help get it out, get it uh, distributed, and, and and get it released. But on set, you were essentially, I mean, you would have had to have been that father figure anyway because you are in every scene, you're number one on the call sheet. You kind of have to be that person. That was the character, too. So I think he was being clever and said, well, if you're a producer, you're kind of like a boss, which you are kind of a boss in the movie, in the club, which is where most of the movie was shot and set. And you're kind of a boss to these people and kind of a father figure. So I think he was being, he was kind of manipulating me a little bit by giving me a little bit of authority uh, in real life as well as in the movie. I would imagine uh, far less... Uh contentious or dramatic behind the scenes as in front of the camera in terms of being the boss far less in behind the scenes yeah I don't, i'd imagine your your role as producer or father figure didn't require as much uh fight breaking no no no, yeah. no it was just more like moral support and keeping people's spirits up during you know this movie was shot uh, at night pretty much um four to four four to five so um which Lisbon's a pretty late night city, like similar to like Barcelona, Madrid, like that type of, you have dinner at like 11 o'clock at night, so. But a lot of the Americans who were there weren't used to those hours as yeah, much. I truly have no idea how people live like that. That's very strange, to us at least, but you kind of get into the groove after a while. I mean, um, Lisbon's a really great place to work, really exciting city. How long were you shooting there? Uh, we, I was there two months, two weeks of rehearsal, and then two, six weeks of shooting. I think we, I think it was thirty, maybe seven weeks, thirty, thirty-five days. I don't remember exactly. Now, one of the things that I, I love about this character, and we saw it in the trailer, there is that he is very committed to this artistic form of stri striptease. It's not even necessarily striptease; it is a cabaret show. Burlesque, yeah, Burlesque. similar. Yeah, that, but that nobody. Kind of tradition. He is being told that nobody really wants that that anymore. Yeah, he's you know. Um, Gentrification is happening in the neighborhood. I mean, it's not. It's shot in Lisbon, but it's not defined in the movie as specifically Lisbon. It's it's more ambiguous. But yeah, I was wondering about that, and that's why I hadn't yeah. brought up the city first. Because yeah, like, I don't know if I missed something while I was watching it, and I don't no. establish that I missed something by not knowing what city it is. It's ambiguous, cool. deliberately. So, but gentrification is happening there, as it is that is, as it did happen and is happening in Lisbon, as it did here in so many other places around the world, and. Um, there's pressures for him to, you know, he loves this misfit world that he's created. They're like his family, and it's um, a dying art form in his way. And, they, you know, there's people who want to make a more of like, turn it into like scores or some kind of high-end strip club where, you know, people spend more money and it's a lot more a corporate sleazy club. or whatever. I mean, th this is a little bit more show busy. That's so strange to me that people would care about that when going to a strip club like i want to go to the strip club that has the brand i identify with you know? i don't the think strip you know club i don't i don't think it it's similar to what it like now strip clubs there's lap dances and stuff like that this was more like the tradition of burlesque was more also entertainment it wasn't just lap dances and pole dancing it was more choreographed numbers in the past and comedians you have mcs musical you have acts have, yeah and he, uh, this character, that's his world, and that's what he likes. And um, it's a symbol, really, of things that get getting threatened by greed and, you know, desire to, to monetize things to the max rather than just make it human and personal. 
So is that what attracted you to this to this role and to and to this movie? Yeah, it's. I mean, Bruno Delmeda, who's a director, is, I did two two movies with him. So before we did the second movie, he he had an idea for this, but it was a musician who was kind of a one hit wonder in the eighties or nineties, and now has fallen on hard times, and he's an expat in Lisbon and got a drug problem, and it was really nothing like what this movie was, but that was the initial idea. He knew where he wanted to set it, which is where we set this movie. And then over an almost nine, ten-year period, it went through different writers, different drafts, got nowhere. We hired uh, one, a guy who, who wrote some other movies that, that are pretty well known. I don't want to mention his name because we didn't go with him, but finally Bruno had a bunch of personal crisis and his deaths in his family and stuff, and he was in this really difficult state and wrote this script in two weeks. And it's this movie, so... Um, we share a lot of sensibilities about how to work and, and what we like. So I, w I would do anything with him, but... Um, Can I ask, what are some of those sensibilities that, that you share in terms of how to work? Well, he wrote pretty much all the roles for the actors who played them, which is... The one movie that I wrote and directed, I did the same thing, really. And similar um, people in them as well, both the ones. And that similar people. Yeah. He believes in kind of, you know, trying to create a group of people. He's done that both here and in Portugal, which is pretty amazing, of, you know, who like to work, who like to um, use themselves in some ways to create, to improvise, to shape things into... Um, to shape things into the story rather than just here's the script, you gotta learn the lines and do it. Like, okay, this is kind of the story. How can your character, how can your sensibility as an artist mold this and shape this? Um, this all this movie is also an homage to Killing of a Chinese Bookie by oh, John yeah. Cassavetes. My character's name is Benny Gaza, and Ben Gazzara played. Uh, the role in the movie it's one of my Cassavetti is my favorite filmmaker and and Chinese Bookie is one of my favorite movies uh, um, but the inspiration for this movie was not that movie oddly enough because there was a cabaret Maxime that Bruno the director got involved in in the mid in, in around 2005 and it was an old burlesque house that had gone from the 20s went to seed in the 70s, became like a porno theater, and then was closed for a number of years, and then was reopened by this painter, musician, a famous guy in Portugal, and became this burlesque, punk rock, uh, you know, like avant-garde performance art, indie cinema. It became much more artistic than the, the place in the movie. This was mo something akin to like uh, the Pyramid Club or 8BC that things that happened in New York in, in the, back in the day. And Bruno was involved in that and booked some acts and some had cinema nights there and stuff. And uh, the neighborhood became started getting gentrified and this con some corporate hotel group bought the building and then there was weird pressure from unsavory characters to move out. I mean, so that was really the idea for this movie. And then we started looking at, well, that's kind of exactly what happened. Well, not exactly, but very similar to what happened in Killing of a Chinese Bookie, which was also about a guy who had this. So there were these... He, have gambling? he has gambling debts he in, has big, in Bookie, big right? He has big gambling debts. Yeah, yeah. And poker Gotta debts. have class. That's right. Class. I remember. Yeah. Style, not class. Is it, is it style, not class? I just, I always remember <laughs> that. Tell me, has you got a lot of class, Mr. Vitelli? He says, style, not class. There's that scene where he's bringing one of his, uh, one of his women to like the, the, the place where he's going to gamble that night or something, and he's like, you got to look classy, honey, or right. you got to look. He brings like, three. He brings three. That's right. Yeah. yeah. He he travels with uh, three, but he's but he's a. So there's there's that parallel, and and it was a you know a conscious nod to that and I've never as an actor um, thought about another actor's performance for a role ever but I did for this because Gazzara is one of my favorite actors but I don't see you doing anything like Gazzara in this it seems to me in a way a little bit. <laughs> really in my mind no I'm not imitating him 
Because Gazara is, uh, and wonderfully so, you know, over the top in both Husbands and in Killing of a Chinese Bookie. I love those performances. Uh, but he's definitely like a cantankerous, big yeah. personality. And what I liked about your character in this is he's fairly reserved and he's kind of studying the room yeah. and seeing how he, he feels a bit more like the boss. He's more of an observer yeah, yeah. Than, than Ben Gazara's character. But in my mind... I was thinking about him, which I'd never, ever done, probably uh, specifically avoided, you know. Um, so there's that connection, and we share that, Bruno and I share that love for that type of cinema. And, um, you know, and it's family. A lot of these actors, John Ventimiglia, who also was in The Sopranos, is Artie Bucco, and Sharon Angela, who was in The Sopranos. We go back to acting school when I was a teenager. You know, before the way before The Sopranos, and we did indie th films and theater together. Bruno's first movie was shot in '97. We were both in that. So, um, what acting school were? Did we met at Lee Strasberg Institute. Oh, it was Lee Strasberg. There was a teacher who broke off and opened her own studio. Her name was Elaine Aiken. Right. And uh, she had an, a great class. Alec Baldwin was in that class for a while, as was um, Sean Young and Lily Taylor and Andrew McCarthy. They were, you know, a lot of really. Um, those are some big good students. <laughs> yeah, um, Alec had just started working. He wasn't like a huge star, but he he was. I think he had done like off Broadway or a soap or something. He was he was about to kind of blow up. But um, so these are people that I've worked with a lot and a lot, and they, they were in my, both of those actors were in my movie that I directed, and my wife and I built a theater, and a lot of these people worked in the theater with us various capacities as directors and um, actors. Are these people that you also, outside of work, spend time with yeah. as well? Yeah. It, yeah. Seems, it would seem that way. Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, Johnny and John Ventimiglia and I lived together in 86 and East 11th Street, you know. So <laughs> we go back, you know, these are, there's something very organic to that, you know, that um, these are people who you've created with in the past and... Um, it's also reflected in the story because we're creating together in, in this club. So um, basically what I'm saying, this is a very personal movie on a lot of levels for me. You know? Does personal for you mean that, uh, I mean, I'm sure, like you said, a lot of levels, there's a number of ways that it's personal, but also just the idea that every day you're showing up and collaborating with your friends, that becomes itself quite personal? That becomes personal, but also your relationship to the material. So it's not autobiographical. Although there are parallels, because I used to own a theater, uh, off-Broadway theater, and produce and hire people and stuff. So there's that. But it's emotionally autobiographical. Like, Do you feel like you had to wrangle personalities a little bit when you managed the theater? When you of course. Yeah. Of course. A hundred percent. Were you good at it? Um, well, I'm still talking to most of those people, so maybe. So it sounds like you are, yeah. Yeah, I've worked with people who've who've directed or managed uh, theater companies, and they don't really, oftentimes, or sometimes, they don't talk to a lot of the people after it happens, or a lot of the people don't talk to them. Right. Well, the key was we weren't a theater company. Mm. We were a theater um, because I had a theater company, and it's very difficult. Um, I think theater works better as a benevolent dictatorship than a democracy. Mm. Too many people can't decide on things, and too many... We, can't, we couldn't decide on a name for the company when we were trying to do it together. When, but we, my wife and I built it, so we were artistic directors, and we, it became a company by default, de facto. People anyway. come in and out, and they yeah, want Yeah, they're to, colleagues yeah. that you go to people. You know, this person would be a good director for this or this play. This person's a great writer. Let's see what they've got, this actor. Not completely. There were other people we met just for specific productions, but... Um, we just found it a lot easier to work that way rather than uh, have 15 people trying to kind of come together and make decisions. Right, vote on something and then yell it's at each other. very hard. I, I tried that. It. it didn't really work. I mean, some companies do it very well, but we, we didn't have much success with that in the past. Um, there's a, a really powerful scene, some uh, incredible acting by you uh, near the end of the film where your lover uh, within the group um, has really kind of lost it and you feel as though the only way that you can reach her in this moment is to sort of lose it on her, which is not what your character wants to be. 
or, or is, but she clearly has a troubled past where that may be the only thing that she responds to when she goes to a certain, um, a certain place. What was it like shooting that scene and, and, and coming up with that? It's it was a pretty really, hard really scene. Hard. Uh, very hard. The actress, this actress, Anna Pedrao, is a um, pretty well-known Portuguese actress. And uh, the second film I did with Bruno is called The Lovebirds, 2007, with an anthology film about Lisbon with different... Um, I think it was about seven different stories, mostly two character stories, and, and her and I did one of them. And she's uh, just a very committed, fearless, passionate, gifted talent, and is willing to really, when you see in the movie, she goes there. Yeah. Um, both Bruno and I have dealt with um, mental illness um, in a very personal way. I don't want to say more than that, but it's sure. been something very close to home. So uh, we discussed that at length on, on, well, how are we going to do that? But it was very difficult. But the only way I was able to really go there that far was because she's um, she and I have a lot of trust and connection, both from having worked together in the past, but just um, as friends um, and uh, you know as colleagues who just say, okay, Go as far as you want. I'm there for you, you know. And you know that that kind of trust. It's not. It's not a given or granted. So or to be taken for granted. Did that scene go as far as it went on the page, or did that come from the conversations that you and, and Bruno had? Without obviously, I'm not, and I'm not trying to pry or pull anything out. I'm just yeah. curious if within those conversations, it's like, well, it seems like this should go to this place because this is how things like the in rehearsal unfold. we found it. And with Anna, and she... It's a great scene. Yeah, she wanted to take it certain places. And, uh, you know, I think had a very deep understanding of the character and was willing to, uh, and wanted to push it far, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there are situations where it's, become, it's becoming life and death, really. I mean, the stakes have, get really, really, really high, so... You try whatever you can to to kind of rein it in and you know bring people back off off the the ledge or the, the edge. ledge literally yeah yeah um, you know the last thing that I think I s last thing you were here for was your book uh, but I think the last thing that I saw you in and there might have been something since then excuse me was um, Escape at Danamora where you played Chris Cuomo Andrew oh Andrew Cuomo excuse me you guys sorry Chris is the the uh, the beefy newscaster uh, Andrew is the is the is the, the governor. governor of New York. Yes. What was it like playing Andrew Cuomo? It didn't seem to me like you were trying to do an Andrew Cuomo. Um, I don't really look so much like him, and they didn't want to go with any kind of like weird uh, prosthetics or anything. Um, he uh, it was interesting because I got to spend some time with him and just talk to him about. Really? How he, uh, yeah, he was very generous with that. How he specifically handled that incident and what, why he handled it the way he did and, and why it was important. And that, that was pretty interesting. Did he ask you lots of Sopranos questions? For some reason, well, I imagine. Well, the Andrew first Cuomo thing he said was we started talking, we were talking about film and television in New York and kind of the, you know, the resurgence and renaissance of that, which he's been very helpful and good to the film television community brought a lot of business to New York which is good and uh, and he did say he never saw the Sopranos really and he said his father never saw the Godfather his father was governor of New York two or three terms I think something like that very beloved smart good guy his, his dad was and I said I know where you're going and you should see the Sopranos because um, it's, oh, it's an that sort important of fear of a, the depiction of Italian Americans. Well, when his father was young, that was a much more, I think, pressing issue, right. you know, um, because there were still like prejudices against Italian. It wasn't, you know, as assimilated as into the culture as as happened later on. You know, his father, you know, was. I don't know, was a lot older, a different generation. And I said, you know, the, the Sopranos really has influenced television and 
pop culture in a very profound way, in a way that really changed the landscape of television. And it's much more than just a depiction of gangst- Italian, Amer- Italian Americans as gangsters. And I th- the humor alone of The Sopranos, I think, has yeah. Been, like, I think I mean that for me, that's what I notice is the sort of like largest influence on pop culture is yeah. how humor was used in that show. How humor and most Italian Americans that I know that I met, it's it's very beloved that show in their consciousness, you know, and 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 they they get it, you know. It's not meant to represent, you know, the entire Italian American experience, you know. It's about, you know, it's about gangsters, but, um, and I said you really should see it, and you should understand what it, what David Chase, who created it, and all the other people involved have contributed to, you know the artistic landscape of Italian Americans and of, you know, you know, and of, uh, of the culture. And, and he's, you know, got what I was saying. He's like, okay, fair enough. And then when we got that out of the way, you know, and then we started talking about the nuts and bolts about the story that we were working on. Do you think he's watched it? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't spoken to him about it. Uh, what was it like working with Ben Stiller on the, uh, uh, on that show? Very good director. Yeah. Really I thought good. that was one of the best things to come out that year. Yeah. Yeah, he's great, and I had a really good time working with him. Um, a lot of actors become good directors, you know. A lot of directors don't really know how to direct actors, and sometimes that's okay, because they cast good people and they let them do what they need to do. Um, what's not okay is when a director doesn't know how to direct actors but thinks they do. What does that look like? It just gets complicated where they kind of give you, you know, they think they need to talk about your character and discuss stuff when, you know, it's just, if you don't know how to do it, then don't. Mm -hmm. But a lot of... Watch actors who are directors do that as well, though. There's an excitement that sometimes a director or a writer feels in the moment, and they feel like a question is a is a reason for them to pontificate endlessly about the character, and you can just watch an actor get confused. Like, just tell me where to go. Just yeah. tell me what, tell you, me what me. you want. Yeah, yeah, and the person and the director is, you know, going off about, like, why the character would do this and who they are and where they're yeah. from. Well, and an actor's like, okay. Like, just yeah, but that might not be where the, what they need to hear at the time. I think it's rarely what it is. It's a, really. Some, act, some directors really understand actors and know what they need. Then there's actors who, like Steve Buscemi, who I've worked with, uh, both as an actor together, but I, he w- I was in the movie that he directed, the, his first film, Trees Lounge. Yeah, great movie. And then he directed uh, some Sopranos, yeah. particularly the, the Pine Barrens episode, which is, which is a great, a really g- classic episode of The is Sopranos. Is the one where you and Polly are lost in the Yeah, world? Steve yeah. directed that. But Steve really can give you great insight into choices you might not have thought of as an actor, I found. Hmm. He's really good at that. You know, in a way that's not, um, you know, intrusive or or disruptive. In a way that's really positive. He's really good. He's a very good director. Did you find that when you directed when you directed a movie that, uh, how did you feel like you were at working with actors? Well, I had directed actors in theater for many years, so it wasn't it wasn't anything new to me, you know, directing actors. But um, uh. You know, I don't know. You'd have to ask them their opinion. But I, I mean, I, I like to think I, I, I'm. I mean, I understand what actors want, at least uh, from my point of view. Try to give them that, you know. And I like to be directed. I like to be given, you know, because sometimes you get locked into your performance, right, and your idea of the character and stuff like that. And just a little nudge can open up a whole room of choices and stuff like that. Because sometimes you're you know, your perspective gets narrow, you know. You have an idea as to what needs to come across and you have trouble throwing it away, right? Yeah, or you just, you think it's right and you're feeling good about it and stuff and it's like, hey, what if, blah, 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 blah. And, oh, and then something really beautiful or interesting or unexpected happens. You make a choice down that way. And 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 that's great. I like that, you know. I don't like to be, but if you don't know how to do that, I don't like to be, I mean, I, I remember I was doing a series and this director came on, I think it might have been the last episode of the season, and he starts going and talking to me about my character. Like, from the whole, I said, listen, I'm the one who's been here for six months. 
You just came on here. I know what this guy. Don't tell me who this guy is. You don't know who this guy is. I know. I'm the one who's been here doing it. Tell me how this scene can be better. Don't start giving me a biography or a psych, psych, psychoanalyst because you don't know, man. Right. right. At that point, it's like, tell me how to best convey what this scene this is This scene, about. yeah. yeah. I, remember I, did a, I did a kid's movie for Nickelodeon, right? A friend of mine wrote it, and uh, the director said, we're doing the take. He goes, okay, do it again. Make like a comical face. And I said, I don't know what that means. I mean, <laughs> I don't really make faces. I kind of play moments or choices. I said, I said, tell me what you want. Am I surprised? It's angry, uh, hysterical, funny. You know, you're, you're tickled, you're laughing. You know, he goes, I'm not really good at... Um, I'm not really good at giving direction. I said, that's kind of the job description. What do you the mean? There? The that's job. the title of the job. You know, it's like, you want me to make a face? I don't know what that means. You know what I mean? I'm not a mime. I mean, it's like, give me a, you know, something to act. Right, comical you know? face. What exactly? Like an angry mean? face could be comical. It was the worst direction I ever got in my life. <laughs> And he was at a loss to tell me what he wanted, you know. And I said, you know, am I ha a more more happy? That I understand. More elated, more excited, you know. That I get. I could translate that. But making a face, I don't know what that means. What did you end up landing on? I don't remember. I must. Your I, idea of a comical face. No, my respect for the guy kind of just disappeared in that moment. <laughs> I just thought, why is this person even here? And how did he get this job? Um, so there, uh, later this year, I think it's this year, um, the Sopranos prequel is coming out. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Christopher wasn't born yet, as far as I know, when the movie takes place. So I can't imagine that you have, are a part of it in some way, or are you? It's possible. It's possible. Anything's possible in movies. Right. Is there, so maybe there's like a dream sequence about the future or a cutaway we to the future? We shall see. Wow. That I'm I'm going with it. Sounds like you are in in some way. It's possible. It's not definite yet. Um. So, are were you excited to possibly work with David Chase again? I'm always excited to possibly work with David Chase. Uh, what is it like to possibly work with David Chase? He's brilliant, yeah. and really funny, hysterically funny. Has a great sense of humor. One of the best writers ever. Do you feel like one of the things that gets lost about The Sopranos and talking about it is how... I mean, it's the one thing that I cling to so much outside of how great of a drama it was is how funny the show was. I think so often people talk about it as this gritty, gangster, dramatic show when it really feels to me when I go back and watch the show, scene by scene, it cares most about having a joke in every scene or having something funny happen in every moment, no matter how dramatic I think it it's was. as much a comedy as it is a drama. Yeah. yeah. When you were shooting that, was that something that you guys knew right away going into it or something that you learned? I'll be honest. When I read the pilot, I wasn't sure if it was uh, what it was. I wasn't sure if it... Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'll be honest. I wasn't... I didn't read the pilot and was blown away saying this is going to be the greatest TV show in history. Uh, f f you know, not I at all. I wouldn't know that. I mean... Yeah. No, it's hard, to, it's hard to know anything from a pilot. And I wasn't sure if it was uh, a spoof. Because there was um, Analyze This came out around then, or was casting then. I'd heard, maybe I'd read it or heard about it, or maybe it was out. Which is which, straight spoof. Which was a mob spoof yeah. about a, a, mo uh, a Don in therapy. And there was also another movie that did not do well called The Don's Analyst, where I think Robert Loggia was in. So I was like, like Mickey Blue Eyes around that time as well, which was like another mob spoof. That was a mob comedy. comedy kind of thing. So I was like, um, it, well, I wasn't sure about it. I didn't know David's work. What I was impressed with was the cast that they were, because I knew Edie. We had done some, some work together in the past. What had you uh, and Edie done? What? We did a pilot that Tom Fontana produced that didn't go called Firehouse. Um, with Richard Dean Anderson, who was the original MacGyver, uh, about firemen, obviously. Um, 
I was wondering what it was about. I wasn't sure. I think Tom Fontana pro- produces her new series, Tommy. Oh yeah, you might be right. I mean, I know who I know. I know he's not the creator, but he might be one of the producers. And he was. Uh, I think she was on Oz a bit right before yeah, the Sopranos, was. so she's had a history with him. But yeah. uh, so Tom Fontana. So we did that, and we did one other thing. Uh, we rehearsed for a. I think we did one other thing because we, we we rehearsed for an audition for something, so we knew each other for a while. And I knew um, you were in the Hal Hartley movie. I mean, you both have been in Hal Hartley yeah. movies, right? But I don't think you were in the same same ones. I was in Flirt and Amateur. I wasn't sure if she was in those. I think she was in Trust, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So and I knew Sirico and Vinny Pastor and uh, Lorraine a bit, and I didn't know Jim. I knew John Dominic Canese, uh Ventimiglia, so I was like, all right, this is great. Yeah. I knew Jim. Jim had a good reputation, but I didn't know his work. I mean, I had seen him in a play. I didn't know him personally, but people always spoke very highly of him. His son is the is playing him in the in the prequel, right? Yeah. Um, did you did you had had you known him? Did you know him at all? Like since a, he was a kid. Yeah. Since he was born. We both had my middle son and Michael were born around the same time really? during production of The Sopranos. Oh, wow. Yeah. So are they, or have they been friends, or have you guys... No. I mean, he, they didn't live in the same places, so they, they didn't get to know each other so much. But. What is it like been, uh, what's it been like watching him come up as an actor? I haven't seen his, him act, I'll be honest. Yeah. I know he was on The Deuce, but I haven't he seen him. He was good it. on The Deuce. Um, but he's a really good kid and a really smart kid. Um, so... I haven't seen the movie. I mean, I'm not involved in the prequel. I was just messing. Not possibly at all. No, I wish. Um, <laughs> no, Christopher was. Um, I assume that you were involved. Christopher was he's not uh, born yet, or he's a baby. Christopher was born in the seventies, right? So, like, wait, the show ninety-seven. He was like t- was supposed to be twenty-five. So he was born in like seventy-two, I guess. And the show takes place in the sixties. The movie takes place Late in the sixties. Yeah, maybe right. there's a scene when he's a baby born. It is about his. I think it's mostly about his father, Christopher's father. Oh, right. Which is uh, played by Alessandro Nivolo, um, Dickie Moltisanti. I think that's he's the main storyline. He's the main storyline? I think so, yeah. Oh, I thought... See, I thought that the main storyline was, uh, was Tony... Tony Soprano? Tony I don't think so. Kid. I'm not oh. sure. I haven't read it. I mean, uh, I hope to see it pretty soon, like in a, in a screening, but I haven't made the screenings. I haven't been in town. You know, we mentioned, uh, I mentioned briefly that you were in these Hal Hartley movies in the 90s. You also uh, were a screenwriter on uh, Summer of Sam, uh, and you had done some other films for Spike as well prior to that, right? Had you? Yeah, I've done six with Spike. I did Jungle Fever, Malcolm X, Girls 6, Clockers, Summer Sam, and Old Boy. And Old Boy, right. Uh, what was the, I mean, you were an actor in New York in the 90s. What was the 90s? New York independent film scene like at that time. I mean, Spike wasn't so much independent by that point. He was basically making studio movies in New York or his version of studio movies. Yeah. But Hal was here and you But had he had an independent movies. spirit. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. His version of his movies, but with studio budgets when they would yeah. do that at that time. But what was the scene like at, at at that time? Did it feel different than it does now, outside of you being a few years younger? Well, independent movies were became kind of a thing in the 90s where they really weren't before then. Like Sundance kind of happened in the 90s and, you know, really kind of took off and um, they would get more releases, it seemed. I mean, that's basically how I made my living in the 90s was doing independent film. I wasn't working working in television then and I did, I wasn't really working in Hollywood on big movies. So mostly that's that was from when I was 25, I started making a living doing that. But the cool thing was a lot of these actors, you know, some of them are these people in this movie who I worked with back then. And um, it was a very good energy, uh, a very exciting. And, you know, people were doing stuff on really low budgets. And the spirit was just the spirit was exciting and the possibilities. And there were a lot of great artists. And and, uh, I think it was um, a very formative time for a lot of actors like Sam Rockwell who I met on the set of In the Soup which was with Steve Buscemi and Seymour Cassell who was a Cassavetes guy directed by Alex Rockwell 
uh, which was shot here in the East Village in this neighborhood. I remember meeting him on the set. I was friends with Steve, and I went to the set, and I met Sam that day. Um, and that movie and Reservoir Dogs both premiered at Sundance, and I was there that year for another project, and I remember seeing both of them at Sundance. So, yeah, I mean, that's that really was the beginning of a lot of great work. I'm curious, when you saw, so you, you saw Reservoir Dogs when you, at, at Sundance? At Sundance, yeah, at a, like a midnight screening. When like you saw it. was saw one of the first screenings of it. Did it feel like you were seeing some kind of like, her, like soon to be heralded, yeah, incredible 100%. Voice? Really? Yeah. I auditioned for it. So I had read the script and I had met him. His scripts read like, no, I mean, yeah. It is a great script. Yeah. Well, somebody, another actor got the script somehow and said, you got to audition for this script. And I read it and, uh, I read with Harvey Keitel. You went on to work with in Clockers. In Clockers and Life on Mars. Oh, yeah. See, yeah. But um, I auditioned for Chris Penn's part. Um, nice guy, Eddie Cabot. Um, I got the audition because at the time, I was working for Martin Scorsese. At, this was after Goodfellas. I was working for his, his, in his office, in his development office. for His, his development person at the time got to know my work through theater, and she hired me to be her assistant. So my job was basically answering phones. It was in the Brill Building. He was on another floor. We were, on the, we were in a little office on a, a lower floor in the Brill Building. Answering phones, I would have to go through every newspaper, Wednesdays and Fridays when the movie reviews came out, Village Voice, The Times, The News, The Post, and cut them out and put them into a scrapbook album because Marty wanted to know about every movie that came out. Documentary, animated, everything. And so he could refer to them and have them in a book. And also, next to our office was his video collection, which was like a video store. And there were people, filmmakers and scholars and friends coming to borrow stuff from his collection and I would have to file them back and stuff like that. That was, that was my job. So she called from Marty's office on my behalf to the casting director of Reservoir Dogs and got me the audition, um, which I didn't get, but the script was really good. And yes, when we saw it, I was with uh, a couple of friends and it was a midnight screening. It was like the first or second screening at Sundance and everyone was just like blown away. It was very, it just was special. Yeah. And he was there and he was so shy and not for weird. Long. He was <laughs> shy and giddy and weird and um, nervous, and uh, it was a. I'll never forget it. It was pretty special. Uh, it's you. Uh, I thought of this because you're mentioning working in Scorsese's office. It's you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In The Sopranos, when Scorsese is coming into the club, that goes. It's not Scorsese. It's a lookalike. Was it really? Yeah. Was it not? <laughs> looks just. Guy just looks just like him and sounds like him. I always thought it was him. Yeah, a guy looks and sounds just like him. Very strange. Really? Yeah. But like in doing an impression of him or just actually in looks, actually looks I, and I sounds think like he him. might lean into the impression of him. Or, yeah. You know, he sounds like him a little bit. Yeah. But it's you or it's Chris, you as Chris who says, Kundun. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was that improvised? Mm. Nothing was improvised on the Sopranos. Zero. You weren't allowed to improvise. It's such. It uh, seems like it, but it was. And actors would come on and guest spots or new actors thinking that they were going to riff and improv and very quickly realized. Because, um, like, a lot of them come from Scorsese's world where you, he wants you to improv, or Spike Lee wants you to improv, wants you to bring ideas. But a movie's very different because a movie only happens once, right? So you can just discover that scene in the moment and just make it as specific. But a series, you've got to follow. This story is being unfolding over 12, 13 episodes for one season and on and on. And I mean, Sopranos didn't really need it. I mean, it really was very specifically tightly written and worked, you know, worked really well. Did, um, do you know if Scorsese ever saw that moment where you said, Kundun, I liked it? I don't know. That's so funny. Question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. The first one is from uh, Lando. Right here. Um, you mentioned earlier there wasn't any um, improvising on The Sopranos. I was wondering, for this film, did you um, do a lot of improvising? And do you remember like any moments? Specifically? There was some improvising. There, it was a combination of both because we, we, we worked, we rewrote a lot of stuff in the rehearsal two weeks before prior to shooting. 
with the actors and finding moments. Um, but there was a freedom to, yeah, if you want to. Improvise, improvisation is tricky because... A lot of actors just try to be funny for some reason when they improvise. I don't know why. Much more tendency is to try to be funny. You find in dramatic moments there's a lot less tendency to improvise. But so you, we had the freedom to improvise, but also you know the, by by the time we started shooting, the script was pretty tight. But there was quite a bit. There's also a combination of actors and non-actors in this movie, um, and. If you're working with non-actors, it's much easier to get an honest performance from them if you let them improvise. Often, non-actors, if you give them scripted dialogue, they can be stiff. A lot of people who don't have a lot of experience in movies, like even like performers who come from a different, like musicians who start to act, if you give, if you let them improv, they can be a lot more honest. They come across so often when you people don't have technique and you give them scripted dialogue, they can stiffen up with it. Uh, Nigel, right here. Hi. Um, you play some very um, complicated and emotional characters over your career span. So I just want to know from an, an actor's perspective, um, what's the process of creating the inner life of those characters? And does it differ if you play in a series where there's a story arc over many seasons versus uh, a film? Um, it only differs because something like The Sopranos where the character evolves over time. A lot of times in television, characters are defined in the first episode, and they pretty much, especially like an episodic thing, like uh, that's not for better or for worse. That's also very effective on TV shows that they don't really evolve; their their function remains the same throughout. But something like The Sopranos does evolve, um, so you go along with it. The script will take you there. But in the beginning, you have to define the emotional life. Who is this guy? Which, for The Sopranos, I molded that character on somebody I knew. No, knew. That person doesn't know that, nor will they ever know that. And nobody knows who it was. But, because um, there were a lot of parallels between Christopher and this guy. What was it about him? Obviously, well, he was a guy who had a one foot in both worlds, both in in movies and in um, organized crime, and um, but there was and and drug addiction, and but there was also this almost larger than life. Like this guy was so would react emotionally to things in a way that I never saw a human being do. Like I'm like, if I made that choice as an actor, I would be really going out on a limb. And then I was like, that might work for this Christopher, you know, because he's kind of unhinged. And, um, you know, where Tony was a bit more of a, you know, grounded figure in some ways. And this kid this kid was like some radioactive isotope kind of in the world, like bouncing off the walls. He was extremely insecure about his place within this world. Yeah. Like constantly overreacting. In every world. To any perceived slight. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's how this guy behaved. Like, sometimes he would behave. You're like, I can't believe there's a human being that acts this way. <laughs> um, my tendency in an actor is sometimes to, to be a bit more subtle and and getting that model kind of forced me out of that comfort zone at that as Michael at that comfort zone that Michael has into being a lot more reactive to everything. This character is a lot different, um, and it was about really finding who he is, what is his relationships to these people, what does he want in this story, what what is driving him through this story. And that has to be done before you start even rehearsal, right? So when you do start rehearsing and then shoot, you can shape that already. But you need that raw material to, to kind of have the foundation of where you're going to go from it. But that's the fun time, is discovering those things and, and um, making those choices and trying to figure out the biography of this guy. We had a whole backstory to who this guy is and how he wound up here and all that stuff that we discussed at length before we even started work. Did you ever find that going in as Chris with this larger-than-life 
character idea that you had, you had to be brought down a little bit or that for the most part, it pretty much fit with what they were thinking when it came to Chris? Um, it pretty much fit. What I didn't finish saying was that, so when we did the pilot, right? I had this guy in mind, this real person from my real life. But once we started, once that was there, I never really thought about it again. He kind of t- had a, took on a momentum of its own. After I imagine that. they started writing for you as well. Yeah. They saw what you were doing, yeah. liked certain things that you were doing, yeah. challenged those things as well as sort of pump yeah. them up even more. Yeah. And then you make it yours. because I'm not playing this guy from real life. I'm playing Christopher Moltisantes, and that becomes yours. So then you, you, have, you, you, you start to have a sixth sense of, okay, how would he behave in this scene? I know how he would behave because I know who he is now. So it takes on a life and a momentum of its own, and you just have to give yourself to it by then. What was the, um, and I'm sure you've been asked this before, but what, is, what was the hardest scene to ever shoot on that show? Um, I'd say the hardest scene, you know, the hardest scenes were whenever he had to kind of get abusive with his yeah. girlfriend. Sometimes he got physical with her, you know, and that, and although Dre was, Dre and I got very close and still are, you know, very good friends and really trust each other as as actors a lot. Still very hard to do those things, you know. Um, the hardest emotionally, I'd say, when when uh, he discovered that she, she she tells him that she's working for the feds because it's just. I mean, those stakes just can't get any higher anymore. It's like somebody's telling you basically that your life as you knew it is now over, you know, and things will never, ever, ever be the same again. Um, but, uh, yeah, that physical physical or violent stuff was always very difficult. Um, I just got the rap sign because I kept you for almost an hour. Sorry about that. Uh, right. Cabaret Maxime uh, is coming to theaters. How can people see it? It's at the Metrograph here in New York, opening Friday, Possibly the twenty first. The best theater in the city. The best theater in the city for for a, a, at least a week. I'll be there at a lot of the screenings to do Q and A's. So if you want to hear me blab even more, you can come see me there. Uh, and then March third, it's going to be released digitally on iTunes, Amazon Prime, uh, in demand, pay per view, that stuff, and then later on other. Uh, streaming platforms and stuff like that. March 3rd, it, 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 you can watch it in the comfort of your own home. Michael Imperioli, everybody, let's hear it. Thank you very much. 